Hey, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Matteo and Alicia, for the invitation. This is, has been a very interesting and educational uh, meeting for me. So I want to uh, talk about uh, a story uh, mostly of experimental evolution. This is a collaboration with the lab of Ariane de Fisser, and it uh, came out in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And it has, this work has been sort of spearheaded by two former postdocs in Ariane's lab, Martin Schenk and Mark Swart. And Mark Swart actually already appeared in the talk of uh, Sarah Duxbury earlier this afternoon. So, so the general context that, we, that we're interested in are factors uh, determining parallel evolution, in particular, of course, evolution of antibiotic resistance. And so very broadly, uh, there are these various uh, aspects that are important. There is on the one hand, there is selection as typified here by selection coefficient. So the strength of mutational effects, the distribution of mutational effects and possibly their interactions. Then of course, there are the rates at which these mutations appear. So there's there are mutation rates. But, but another important factor that I want to emphasize here in this talk is, is the size of the population. And of course, all these factors sort of interact with each other. So the, the competition between mutations that are selected or that are prominent because of high selection effects uh, versus mutations that occur at high rate. This is sort of the, the theme of, of the effects of mutation bias. Of course, the mutation rate and the population size together um, determine the supply of mutations. And, and uh, uh, there is, in addition, this important effect of clonal interference, which sort of filters out mutations of particularly strong effect in large uh, populations. So all these factors you'll see are sort of interacting uh, in this uh, story that I want to tell you. And a plasmid also appears in the story. So otherwise, I wouldn't be here. But, but you'll see that the plasmid is maybe not the most important thing. So, so the model system that we have been working on for a number of years is uh, a well-known antibiotic resistance uh, enzyme, tem one beta lactamase which originally uh, arose as a resistance enzyme against ampicillin. And, and what, what uh, our uh, studies and many other studies are looking at are how this, uh, um, uh, this enzyme can adapt to novel antibiotics in particular uh, how it can raise its low activity against cefotaxim uh, by mutations. And we have spent a lot of time on sort of characterizing these mutations, uh, uh, determining their properties and their interactions and so on. Uh, but so the experiment that I want to describe was uh, there, the, 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 the scope was a bit broader. So the question here was, uh, how does, how do populations evolve resistance against um, uh, cefotaxim in a sort of more open-ended way. Okay, so, so these, these experiments uh, uh, looked at uh, the adaptation of E. coli to increasing levels of cefotaxim in standard serial transfer experiments over 500 generations. Um, these uh, bacteria were, were um, uh, had, uh, had the, the TEM1 gene on a multi-copied but non-conjugative plasmid. So, so they, they, they did have the TEM1, but as I said, this is a very bad TEM1, which doesn't do much against cefotaxin. In order to maintain the plasmid, there was also a tetracycline resistance gene on the, on the plasmid, and there was tetracycline in the medium. Um, and so, so uh, in this experiment, uh, resistance against cefotaxin could evolve through mutations that could occur either on the plasmid or on the chromosome. Uh, uh, corresponding to different kinds of, <clears throat> of, of resistance mechanisms. And this was what we were, were interested in. And particularly since we're interested in, on the, in the effect of population size, these experiments were carried out at two different population sizes. So two times 10 to the six and two times 10 to the eight. And altogether, there were about a hundred parallel lines that were studied. Uh, just a word on the experimental protocol. So I was, I said the cefotaxim concentration is increasing, and the way this was increased was to simply increase the concentration by a, by a fixed factor whenever the OD reached 75% of the ancestral value. So in this way, we sort of tried to keep these populations more or less at a constant selective pressure. And what you can see in this plot, so here you see sort of the the, the concentration trajectories 
of the small populations in red and the large populations in blue. And you see that the, the, the blue populations are essentially all, all, are already sort of evolving at the maximal rate, whereas in the small populations, there is more variability. And of course, the small populations reach lower resistance levels than the large ones, simply because they have access to less mutations. Um, so, so this was uh, this experiment was carried out for uh, 500 generations, and then uh, we looked at at what had come out. So, so we were interested in looking at the mutations that were present at the endpoint, and so the sequencing received uh, revealed about 1,200 mutations. And what was what was particularly interesting here is that there are sort of mutations of different classes. So there are SNPs, there are there are different kinds of structural variants. And we decided to sort of distinguish here between small scale insertions and deletions, so less than one kilo base pair, and large scale variants, uh, which are larger than one kilo base. Among these structural variants, a particularly prominent one, which was actually unexpected, was a deletion of the TEM1. Okay, so a lot of these populations actually got rid of the TEM1 because it didn't do them any good. And this is sort of a separate story uh, that I will come back to at the, at the end. On average, there were about 10 mutations per line, and, uh, and this number was essentially the same in the large and in the small uh, mutation uh, populations. And that already tells you that clonal interference played an important role. So the, the bigger uh, mutation supply in the large populations didn't mean that they ended up having more mutations, but they just ended up having different mutations. Uh, so, so this is a, a, um, a, a picture of the panel of mutations that we found. This is, of course, not you know, easy to read, certainly not in this kind of format, but just to sort of uh, you know, explain a little bit. So, so here is the, the chromosome, here is the plasmid. Uh, these are the small populations in red and the large populations in blue. And the one thing that I want you to notice here are these red bars on, on the, on the right-hand side, which correspond to the deletion of the tem one gene. Right? So, so a lot of, in particular, the small populations often deleted the TEM1 gene. Uh, in some cases, since this is a plasmid that is present in multiple copies, in some cases, some of the copies had it and others not. But this was a very prominent event, and I'll get back to it at the, at the end of the talk. OK, um, so, so now you, you can, uh, and so as I said, the, the, the thing that we want to focus on now are these different mutation classes. And so this is uh, to begin with a histogram of the number of mutations per line in these different classes, SNPs, small scale indels, large scale structural variants. And you see that, uh, that there, is a, a, so, there are some differences. Most importantly, in the small populations, you have less SNPs and you have many more structural variants, which is sort of hinting at, at the, the main storyline that I want to get to. But, but since we were interested in parallel evolution, we wanted particularly to look at uh, the, the similarity of these endpoint clones. So we introduced uh, a repeat, repeatability index. So the difficulty here is, of course, that you're sort of comparing apples and oranges. You have SNPs and you have these large scale structural variants, and they sort of occur at the same time. So how can you define similarity on that basis? So what we did was basically to, to define a kind of normalized similarity based on the overlap of these mutational events, right? So for a pair of genotypes with M versus N mutations, you look at the overlap between all the, all the, all the uh, events, their sizes, you, you normalize this by the size of either one or the other. So this index is not symmetric under A and B. So in order to symmetrize it, you just take the average of HAB and HBA. So this is just a, you know, a convenient way of being able to, to, to determine similarity uh, between mutational events of very different scales. Now, if you, if you do that, um, then uh, you can look at, you can sort of quantify the repeatability. So essentially you, you take your, 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 uh, your endpoint uh, genotypes and you, you determine all pairwise comparisons and then you average this over all the pairs. So that gives you a kind of overall repeatability uh, pairwise similarity between the endpoints. And you can do that on the nucleotide level or you can do that on the gene level. So on the gene level, you just ask whether uh, a particular gene is affected or not. 
One very conspicuous pattern here that you see is that there is more repeatability on the gene versus nucleotide level. This is of course expected because it's a sort of coarse grain scale. You also see that repeatability is, is stronger in large than in small populations. This was also expected because you, you, know, you have more clonal interference, so things become more deterministic and you expect to have more, more uh, repeatability. The really striking and unexpected finding, however, is this picture, which now compares the similarity for different mutation classes. And here I just show the SNPs and the structural variants. And so here you see that repeatability in the large populations is driven by the SNPs. So you have a couple of SNPs that are, that are common and that occur over and over again. But in the small populations, it's much more strongly driven by the structural variants. Right? So, so, so this means that, that different classes of mutations are important for the adaptation in small versus large populations. So where does this come from? So our hypothesis was that the population size mediates a transition from structural variants to SNPs. And this happens because the structural variants tend to have higher rates and smaller effects than the SNPs. Okay, so that was, so, so this was sort of a hypo, the hypothesis. And why would that lead to this pattern? Well, this is uh, uh, the, uh, due to clonal interference. So this is sort of schematically shown here. So if you compare a small population and a large population in a Muller plot like this, and you have two types of mutations, high rate, small effect mutations and low rate, large effect mutations, then in the small population, the first type of mutation that appears is likely to be a high rate, small effect mutation, and that will then fix. Now in the large population, uh, uh, at not too soon, uh, no, not too, too much later, uh, a low rate large effect mutation can appear and this can then displace, sort of outcompete the high rate small effect mutation and so the blue mutation fixes instead. So this is sort of, so this is essentially a kind of competition between mutation bias and clonal interference, right? So you have uh, mutations that are favored because of high rate uh, and, and you have mutations that are favored uh, because of, of a large uh, effect. And, and the balance between these two is shaped by, uh, by population size. Now, this is a kind of uh, theoretical problem that has been uh, discussed in the literature uh, uh, quite a bit. In particular, a sort of minimal model of this was introduced by Jan Polsky and Stoßfuß. So, so the minimal version is the following. Suppose you just have some wild type the genotype, and then you have sort of two alternative mutations uh, with rates mu a and mu b and, and selection coefficients s a and s b. And let's assume that the a mutation has higher rate uh, but lower effect. So then the, you can ask what is the probability that a fixes first, okay? Um, and this was studied numerically by Jan Polsky and Stolzfus. Uh, now it turns out that you can sort of develop a rather complete analytic treatment of this problem based on earlier work that we did with Kavita Jain. Um, and I don't want to go into that here. This is work in, in, in progress with Suchan Park. Uh, and, and this picture is just you know, supposed to show you that, that we understand this problem. So this is a comparison between simulations and an analytic formula. Uh, and you should just see that this sort of matches. So what you see here is always that the, the probability for the high rate mutation to fix goes to zero as the, muta at, as the population size increases. Uh, and so these are sort of different pairings of selection coefficients and these are different ratios of mutation rates. So here the mutation rates are the same. So in, at, 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 in the small population, the neutral limit, the ratio is just one half. Here, the ratio between the mutation rates is 100. So you start essentially only seeing the, the high rate mutations, but at population sizes of 10 to the six, you only see the, 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 the high effect mutation. So this is how population size sort of drives you from uh, mutation dominated to selection dominated behavior. So this, was, this is sort of the hypothesis. Now, is this actually true? So how can you sort of uh, check that? Of course, it's not easy for these thousands of mutations to determine their rates and their, their effect sizes. Uh, so we have sort of two, two kinds of evidence for this. One is that we can look at, at time resolved data. So we, we didn't do that for all the 100 lines, but for five small and five large populations, uh, we sequenced uh, the populations at multiple time points and try to sort of reconstruct 
model plots uh, of these mutational events. Of course, the information that we have is only at these time points. So, you know, these, these uh, plots that Mark Swart created should be taken uh, with, a, with a grain of salt, but this is roughly what we think is happening. And if you, if you do that, then you see that in fact, in the small populations, uh, the, the large scale duplications and deletions, which are red and, 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 and green here, tend to appear first, whereas the SNPs, which are blue, tend to appear later. And in the large populations, the order tends to be the other way around. So the SNPs appear earlier and tend to dominate the evolution. So this is, and this is statistically significant. You can see that, you can show that the order of events is, is different in large and small populations. The other piece of evidence, uh, and this is work was, was work by my uh, postdoc Sun Min Wang, who is now in Paris, uh, it was a, a kind of uh, a, a simulation approach. So what Sung Min did was to simulate, use standard right Fisher simulations with three classes of mutations with which all of them had exponentially distributed fitness effects, but with different rates and different mean strength. And so, so in principle, this means that you have like these six parameters and, and, and there is, you know, there is, there is in principle a kind of map that takes these parameters to, to the, the um, mean and standard deviation of the number of mutations in the respective classes at the endpoint. Okay, so Sangmin used the neural network to sort of learn this relation. And this then allowed us to estimate the selection coefficients and the mutation rates from the endpoint data. And this confirmed the hypothesis in the sense that the SNPs turned out to have the largest selection coefficient, the structure variance, the smallest one, and the rates also uh, were ordered in the opposite direction and with a very significant difference in the rates between the SNPs and the structural variance. And in fact, these selection coefficients, at least in, in relative terms, I think the absolute values shouldn't be taken too seriously because there are lots of things about this model that are not realistic, um, but the ratios are consistent with an analysis based only on the MIC values using a generalized linear model. Okay, so this is basically uh, why we think that, that this um, hypothesis is confirmed. So let me finally say a little bit about the TEM1 deletion. Um, so, so what we observed here is that uh, TEM1 is often deleted from the plasmid unless it is rescued by a point mutation, right? So basically you have this costly and useless uh, TEM1 and, and you either have to get rid of it or you have to mutate it uh, to, 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 to make it work. And this is one of the large populations where this is happening. So after hundred generations, uh, the, 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 to a large extent, uh, the, the TEM1 has been deleted, but then there is a kind of rescue mutation. This is called G238S. So this is one of the most powerful activating mutations which sort of saves the day. And then the plasmid uh, is, is, or the, the, the TEM1 is, is, uh, is maintained. Uh, so why does this deletion occur? So this is apparently, you know, somehow related to the construction of the plasmid, which has these repeated regions, uh, which, which tend to promote this kind of deletion. Uh, we see that this happens more frequently in small populations. And this is again, you know, because the SNPs that, we, that you need to rescue the, the TEM1 are more likely to occur in, in large populations. Remarkably, uh, we, we do not find that this TEM1 really has a cost or a benefit. So this is, this is, these are fitness ratios based on, on um, uh, competition assays. And here you see that the TEM1 deletion is, is essentially neutral. On the other hand, the G238S mutations are this activating mutation has a strong benefit at large, uh, large enough uh, cefotaxin concentrations, and it has a significant cost at low cefotaxin concentrations. So it's clear that the G238S is, is selected for, um, but, but the, there is no selection, there's no cost or benefit of the deletion, uh, which implies that the reason why it occurs has to be related to the fact that it has a very high rate. Um, and so, so uh, in some sense, this, this alternative of TEM1 activation or loss defines alternative pathways to resistance. And if, so, so this is again, small and large populations comparing the MIC levels or the MIC increases that you achieve if you activate the, plas, uh, the, the, the TEM1, if you lose it or if you maintain it. And what you can see is that activation gives you a significantly higher 
uh, MIC than 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 uh, if you if you get rid of it or if you if you maintain it, right? So so these are sort of and and this is uh, more this happens much more frequently in the large populations. Okay, so with that I'm I'm uh, uh, I come to the end. So. Um, what I have told you here is a story about the contributions of mutation bias and clonal interference to parallel evolution. So we saw how the population size sort of selects for different classes of mutational events. Uh, sort of maybe methodologically interesting is this approach of inferring mutation rates and effect sizes. Um, and uh, you see that, that if in order to evolve high resistance, uh, the, the, the pathway using this term one activation is, is, uh, is needed. Uh, the experiments were done, as I said, by Ariane de Fisser, Martin, Martin Schenk, and Mark Swart, and the theory uh, by Sungmin Wang, who is now in Paris, and uh, also my long-term collaborator, Suchan Park from Seoul. And so with that, let me thank you for your attention. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Hawking. So maybe we have time for uh, uh, some one or two questions, other questions. So otherwise we postpone to the uh, discussion session.